Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for the monthly meeting of the DC Grassroots Planning Coalition. I'm Perry Sunaruzi, Director of Empower DC and I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, before we get started, I just wanna remind everybody to please mute yourself and keep yourself muted um, unless uh, called on to speak at some point. I'll do my best to assist with that as well. Um, we are expecting uh, some more individuals to join us, so but we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who I, I imagine most of you have been part of the DC Grassroots Planning Coalition, uh, but for those of you who may possibly be new, uh, we started this in the spring of 2017. We're led by a steering committee that meets regularly, um, volunteer individuals from across the city, as well as a few folks that represent organizations, um, including the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless and People for Fairness Coalition. And of course, we started this um, as a means of bringing groups of people together across the city to make sure that we are fighting for community-led equitable development um, and fighting the displacement of Black residents and communities in particular, um, making sure that we have uh, deeply affordable housing and housing for families. And so we, we knew that the city's comprehensive plan was an important document, a, an important planning tool that we needed to weigh in on. And of course, um, we've been doing that uh, since that time. So uh, many of you probably participated in the hearings um, in 2018 and again recently, and we're gonna, uh, today, one of the things we'll be doing is debriefing that recent hearing. Uh, we've also had the opportunity to do some uh, smaller meetings across the city uh, prior to the pandemic, of course, um, some study circles, and just generally work together to try to shape the narrative around what is really happening in the city and what is really needed. And these are our guiding principles. Um, we're really uh, committed to racial justice. We're committed to um, also economic justice. We want to stop the displacement of residents. You all know, you know, we've, we've uh, lost over 40,000 Black residents um, since 2000. We want to um, advance environmental justice, make sure that there's equitable access to public services and resources. And, and we ultimately believe that people who are directly impacted, uh, whether they are tenants or community members, need to be at the forefront, at the leading edge of development decisions, not at the, you know, at the tail end, uh, trying to make sure that um, equity is heard. That, that starts with community-led equitable development. I want to invite you all now, if you wouldn't mind in the chat, just to introduce yourself. Um, you can just state your name and neighborhood or ward. Um, we'd just love to see the cross-section of um, especially geographic representation in these meetings. And, and again, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to mute your line if you're not muted. I'm seeing a lot of different wards represented. Very exciting. Thank you. Thanks again for being here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and mute people if, if I see that lines are unmuted. And if, if you need assistance unmuting later, I can help. I can help with that. So it looks like we have uh, seen pretty much every ward represented, I think, so far. So that's great. Thank you all and continue to do that. So this is the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin here in a second, and she's going to uh, talk a little bit about the recent comp plan hearings and uh, debrief our participation in um, those hearings. And then we're going to be welcoming Chairman Phil Mendelson. Um, he'll be uh, starting with some opening uh, remarks. We hope to share his perspective on the, the recent hearings. Um, and then we'll engage in Q&A and discussion with him for about an hour. Um, and then we will talk about next steps. And of course, we're really, you know, we're not done yet, right? The comp plan has not been passed. It's not finalized. Um, that probably will happen early next year, maybe February of next year. So we do still have some work to do. And we want to uh, work with you all on that. So if we're ready, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Caitlin. Thanks, Parisa. Hi, everyone. 
Um, really quick housekeeping too. We are recording this. I don't know if Teresa mentioned that. So if you don't want to be seen, you know, you can turn your camera off, but um, I don't think it's being live streamed. So we will have this and we'll share it out. Okay, it's not being live streamed right now. Um, thank you all for being here. It's really exciting every time <laughs> to have so many people come on like right away too. And I know many of you participated and have been participating in the comp plan um, hearings. So this may be repeat information for you, but um, hopefully it's a slightly different perspective and we would definitely welcome feedback from other people too. This is just what we gleaned from it. If you did participate, if you testified or submitted written testimony and wanna put that in the chat, I know our chat's blowing up with where people are from, but if you wanna indicate that in the chat too, please go ahead and do that. As um, everyone knows, again, just as a refresher, the comp plan is a 1,000 plus page document. So I think it's pushing 1,600 pages now, at least with the amendments. And it's a 20 year framework, which anticipates and guides future development decisions across a variety of things. So this is basically the head honcho document that impacts all of our lives and many people don't even know that they're impacted by this thing. Um, I think more and more people are aware of it, which is great. Um, and that kind of speaks to the organizing efforts that many of you on this call have been doing for the past several years. So thank you for that. Um, every 20 years, the plan is supposed to be rewritten and there is supposed to be an amendment process that happens in the interim period. So about every five to 10 years. The current plan that we are talking about was adopted by council in 2006. And the way that the document itself, just again, very big, is broken down um, is into four different elements. The first volume is the framework, which was already voted on and passed by council in October of last year. And the first volume also includes the citywide elements. So these are things that affect the entire city. It might have to do with housing, land use, um, the environment, and various things like that. The second volume is the area elements. So that is broken down by a specific location around the city. As many of you know, there the area elements actually do not directly correlate to the wards. There's actually 10 of them. And that's because the wards are a political designation and they change versus the area elements are more set in stone. And then the third volume is the implementation and the glossary. So the implementation chapter kind of talks about how the comp plan is supposed to be used. And the glossary is technically not implemented in the same way as the rest of the chapters, but it does have specific definitions, specific provisions that if you're reading through the comp plan and you say, I don't know what that means, you can go back and check it. The last one is the future land use maps and the generalized policy maps. Um, these ones are very important and critical. As we know, there's been a ton of talk about the changes to the maps this year. And those work in conjunction in part with the zoning map. So they're not the zoning maps, but they definitely go hand in hand with those. In terms of the timeline and where we are now, the Office of Planning submitted their final proposed changes to this new version in April of 2020. So earlier this year, right when the pandemic was breaking out, um, this was just getting given to council by the Office of Planning. The chairman and a few other council members who were able to participate held hearings on this amended version of the plan a month ago today. So November 12th and November 13th. Um, it was a two day hearing, not like the framework, but just as long and very reminiscent of that. And currently um, committee staff is working on compiling their report. The chairman, he can speak more to this and we'll confirm with him that this timeline is accurate, but he predicted that council will vote on or and pass the plan, hopefully, when it returns um, next council session in January or February. And that's anticipated to happen before budget season. If you wanna check out the proposed changes that the Office of Planning proposed, you can go to plandc.dc.gov. So just as a reminder, again, I know many of you are familiar with these already, but the Grassroots Planning Coalition put out a list of housing justice priorities. This is in line with the work that we did around the framework, and it just highlights some of the specific principles that we wanted to see included in the comprehensive plan. Oftentimes, there's a lot of rhetoric that's thrown out around the plan, but once you dig into it, you have to kind of really, as many of you know, you have to really look at it and see how it's going to have an impact on communities. And we want to make sure that the changes to the plan are reflective of these values and are reflective of the things that many people in positions of power say they want to see. So if we say they want those things to happen, then we have to make sure that they can actually happen using this particular document. Um, the priorities, just to run through them briefly, 
are to expand rent control to buildings built before 2005, preserve and improve public housing, meet the homeward DC goals to house the unhoused, expand rental subsidies, and promote community-led equitable development. So these are overviews, but there were more specifics in the letter itself. And this is a list of organizations and some individuals who have signed on. I will say for those of you who participated in or had a chance to watch any of the hearings on November 12th and 13th, you heard many people citing these as um, things that they wanted to see included into the comprehensive plan too. So this is not, I will say this is not an extensive list. This is just the people who officially signed on to the priorities. In terms of the hearing itself, um, again, it was a two-day hearing. There were approximately 200 people on the witness list. If you go on to um, Chairman Mendelson's website, there's a whole comp plan page and maybe Teresa, if you can drop that in the chat as well, if you're able to find it. Um, there were 110 people listed for day one and 84 listed for day two. And it was different, of course, because it was virtual, but it was still very powerful, very impactful. Um, for me, it was reminiscent of the framework hearing back in March of 2018. There were kind of, for those of you who are at the framework, the white buttons and the yellow buttons. So it was all these people that were calling for the creation of affordable housing and some calling for the creation of just housing in general. But, half, it, and I won't say it was half, I will say some of those folks were saying, pass the comp plan as is with these proposed changes and that's how we'll accomplish these housing goals. And another large group of people were saying, no, don't pass them as is because you won't actually be achieving much of anything and you really won't be assisting the people that you claim to want to be helping. Um, so there's this dichotomy. And I always think about if someone was watching who was unfamiliar with this, they would probably be super confused because it, it, you know, it seems to be unclear, but as we know, it's, it's actually not, um, it's pretty clear like what needs to happen in order to accomplish those goals. In terms of more details on that, there was discussion around, um, you know, increasing growth west of Rock Creek Park in the Ward 3 area um, to make up for a history of redlining. You heard a lot of people talk about that. But then on the other side, you talk about people acknowledging that, yes, while there have been disparities, development disparities happening across the city for years, um, the way that the Office of Planning has proposed its current amendments is not going to rectify that in a way that's sufficient. It's not going to achieve those goals. And I'll say too, it was, it was very powerful. And at least for me, like it, it was clear that many of the people that I observed testifying, um, at least like the newer transplants to the city, I think that they were well-intentioned. I do think that people genuinely believe that in order to make up for historical um, past that have been discriminatory, especially against black people, against people with lower incomes. Some of, you know, we need to do something drastic in order to rectify that. But there just seems to be a misunderstanding about the details. So you could tell kind of who was newer to this, this idea and this um, development and planning happening around DC and who has been in this fight for a very long time. Um, there were a lot of longtime residents who spoke about personal experiences and talked about their neighborhoods changing. Um, there were some people who were supportive of particular sections of the plan that the Office of Planning may have incorporated their specific amendments for that. And so for that reason, they did want to see passage of this plan, which is totally understandable. Um, but I think, again, like I said, for me, it, it was it was kind of clear that I think a lot of people just didn't fully understand the breadth of how development happens in the city. and with some more understanding, with some more connections and relationship building, I'm hopeful that that can um, change and hopefully change for the better. The chairman, and again, we'll check, confirm um, with him on this and let him speak to this a bit more, but there were some folks who were pushing for the passage of the plan really quickly by the end of this year. And he made it very clear that that was just an impossibility um, by the sheer size of the document and just the timing of you know, the council sessions and everything. He and Andrew Trueblood, the director of the Office of Planning. Um, yes, thank you, Naima, for folks in the chat. So Naima just posted that the vast majority of the people of color who testified were opposed to the proposed amendments. I can't see the rest of it. Um, and yeah, there was a racial line, uh, I will say, between those who were supporting and those who were saying that some changes needed to happen first. 
So yeah, so the Andrew Trueblood and Chairman Mendelson both agreed that the new, whatever new version of the comp plan after this, which the Office of Planning is hoping to have done by 2025, needs to be more succinct. Um, and yeah, and so there was some back and forth about that. And then after the plan, or after those hearings itself on the 12th and 13th, there were three roundtables, quote unquote. They weren't official council roundtables, but they were more of town halls or open houses. Um, and we had pushed for these, asking some of the council members to have ward level sessions because this is such a dense document and even two days of hearings may not be enough to fully digest it, especially for council members who may not have been there. And so there was one with Brianna Doe for Ward 1, one with Brooke Pinto for Ward 2, and one with um, Charles Allen for Ward 6. And those all happened, I think, the week after. They were set up slightly differently. Um, some were a bit more closed than others. But from what I've heard, I attended just the Ward 1 one. I live in Ward 1. Um, but from what we gleaned from other people, too, it sounds like all of them had a decent turnout from folks between, I think, like, 15 to maybe 40 people per session. Um, and if I'm wrong, people can correct me in the chat. And there were good discussions, I think, amongst the, the different people that were there. Um, but I think what it showed is that those were good to have and we need to continue to do that engagement with our council members over the next month and a half to two months before the vote happens to make sure that we're all on the same page about what the changes mean for the comp plan. much, Caitlin. So um, Phil Mendelson has joined us. I think what we're going to do next is um, I'll introduce him, allow him to speak. And then just as a reminder, then we're going to have a uh, question and answer and discussion. First, Caitlin is going to present some questions um, that the steering committee came up with. Uh, we have a few folks that have been active with us lined up to ask questions. And then we're going to invite questions in the chat. So you can go ahead as you want, um, as the chairman start speaking um, and putting your questions in the in the chat and we'll do our best to track that. Um, we're happy that Chairman Phil Mendelson has agreed to join us again. I think this is maybe the third or fourth time um, that he's joined us uh, with the DC Grassroots Planning Coalition meeting. Or the seventh or eighth or twelfth. Does it feel like that? Okay well I'm gonna um, I'm, let me un unshare my screen so that I can highlight you. And uh, just as a reminder, the chairman has been in elected office since 1981 when he was originally elected as an ANC commissioner. He served as an at-large uh, council member from 1999 to 2012 and has served as the chairman of the city council since 2012. Uh, um, chairman Mendelson, we uh, welcome your opening remarks and would love to hear your impressions of the recent hearing and the process uh, for the comp plan. Thanks again for being here. Oh, thank you, Prusa. And uh, actually, Caitlin summarized it. I, I came in while she was speaking, so I didn't hear everything, but she summarized it well enough that I think I could just like go home and, but actually I'll stick around to answer questions. Um, so we did have two days of testimony. And among other things, the testimony in my view made clear that um, this is not a document that has broad, um, when I say broad, I mean overwhelming support. Uh, there was quite a bit of criticism at the uh, at the hearing of different aspects of the um, proposed changes to the comprehensive plan. Uh, and yes, there were individuals who were saying that we should pass it as is immediately, um, as if they were just tone deaf to what everyone else was saying. And um, uh, what I have been uh, consistently clear about is that uh, uh, we got the plan too late. It, it, there are way too many changes being proposed. There is enough controversy around it that we will take this up in the new year and report this out of the council before we get the budget. Uh, so there is an end in sight, but um, doing it before the end of this calendar year was not realistic and was ignoring all of the uh, testimony that either was critical or suggested or requested changes. Um, the, um, 
uh, on this call is uh, uh, Julia Coster, who is on my staff working on the plan. So she's hearing what people are saying. And I think many, if not most of you know how to reach out to my office and talk to her with regard to the, um, the plan. Um, I would characterize the testimony. This is a bit oversimplifying it, but I would characterize it as people who say, we need affordable housing in the city. And the way we get that is by minimizing restrictions on development so that there can be as much unfettered housing development as possible to get, um, get the additional affordable housing. And then others who are saying, wait a minute, this just can't be carte blanche to whatever developers want. Uh, actually, if we want affordable housing, we need to be more focused on how we're going to extract affordable housing out of uh, the develop development process. Uh, in the former camp are folks who say that it's a good thing that we, the mayors proposed that we would remove from the comprehensive plan directive language. And on the other side are folks who say that the directive language makes the plan more meaningful, that there shall be more housing here or there shall be um, name another policy. At, at another place. My own view, and I have said this, is that I think that a plan needs to be more meaningful, and that is that it shouldn't be just so vague that really one can read whatever they want to into the plan. Um, so I know that a concern is the issue of housing and affordable housing uh, we addressed that in quite a bit of detail when we worked on the framework a year ago. And um, at this point where I think the, the real action has to be is in looking at the um, land use map. So I know that there's gonna be attention to other elements like the housing element, but um, I, I think that the, the most important of the different elements of the planets before us is the, uh, let the are the land use maps. I do want to say that when it gets down to specific proposals, uh, very specific proposals, like for this location at 13th and E, for example, that uh, the process, the dynamic of the process in the council is one where there's a lot of difference given deference given to the ward member. So to the extent that anyone on this call or that the coalition has concerns about very specific sites, sure, you can talk to me and you can um, persuade me. But if the ward member is um, disagreeing, um, that's going to have substantial weight. And so it's important that you try to uh, include the ward member in your support. I think with that, um, I'll take open it up for questions. Okay, and again, we're going to start with questions that Caitlin is going to share um, with you. I'm going to see if I can. I don't know if I can spotlight both of you. I'll try, but go ahead, Caitlin. Do you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, so thank you, Chairman Mendelson, for being here again. Thank um, you. The first question, I know you mentioned that the maps are one of the most important places for people to look at. And one of the questions from the steering committee is, given that the increases, the density increases on the FLUM, the future land use map, were generated by property owners, not by the Office of Planning in pursuit of specific ends, so speaking to allowing for more development to happen, um, and that the framework was altered to set up residence challenges to the projects to fail, do you think that the council should approve the citywide changes on the FLUM? I know that's a broad question and it might have some more specifics within there, but on the whole, what do you think about that? Well, it is a broad question. Um, I'm not gonna say yes or no in a blanket way. I think we have to look at the uh, changes more individually. Uh, I think really where we will look at them is where there's controversy. So, I mean, and that's not to say that um, I'm going to ignore everything else, but uh, the the ones that will we'll get the most attention are the ones about which there is some disagreement. I don't think that the um, changes to the land use map should be motivated solely by a developer's request. 
um, because implicit in that is that uh, whatever the plan has called for, a developer wants a change to do something else, which is to their economic advantage. Uh, so there has to be more to it than that. We do need more housing. And to get more housing, we probably need to increase density in some areas. Um, if that's, if, if what a developer is seeking is consistent with that, then um, in a general way, I would say yes, then those changes are acceptable. If a developer is simply trying to revisit a, um, a site to increase the density, um, and it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it's not compelling in terms of advancing goals such as housing, then no, we shouldn't uh, accept that. It gets more complicated quickly because if a ward member thinks it's a great idea and actually there's no neighborhood opposition expressed, then, um, then it probably will go through. So there are a lot of changes and uh, we, we're gonna have to look at them more, more individually. To your point about if you're looking at a specific amendment and it does allow for more housing, are you talking about any type of housing? Or are you specifically talking about affordable housing and which levels of affordability would you give greater weight to, if any? Um, there's not a blanket answer I can give to that. The, um, uh, I, um, you know, the reality is that we have a housing shortage. We, um, and what we are seeing is that in some neighborhoods that are affordable, that the prices are being driven up quickly because uh, people who are not of low means, uh, of low income, um, are going into those neighborhoods. That's increasing prices. So to the extent that we can increase the supply of housing generally, that's a good thing. But we also know that there is a huge shortage of affordable housing and that affordable housing is at all levels. I think we make a mistake if we focus only on let's say 30% and below of AMI. We also make a mistake if we only focus at let's say above 60% AMI. Um, actually the, the map itself would not, would not just differentiate between um, affordability in terms of the policies, I think, and I've been consistent in saying that we need to be advancing housing and affordable housing. And then we have other tools that are outside the plan that can help, for example, with um, extremely low income housing, such as the Housing Production Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. And another question that we got from a steering committee member that relates to this, I think, in terms of the actual amount of housing that we have um, relates to the the office of or the chief financial officer's report from last December that talks about the number of vacant units um, and vacant luxury units, and they were asking how do how do those metrics play into the current compre comprehensive plan draft and this analysis of a need for more housing. Um, well, thus far in the committee's work, we've not been looking at that in the background work that the Office of Planning did. Uh, presumably they looked at that. As we get closer to getting ready for markup, to the extent that this would affect some of our decisions, then we will look at it. Another question that well, actually, this is another follow up too. So during the hearing itself, I know you had some back and forths both with um, Officer or Director Trueblood and a couple other folks about the New York Avenue corridor specifically. And I'm raising this in conjunction with the maps because I know you had this back and forth questioning with him about if they do allow for that area to be up plumbed or increase in density, even though they say that they wanna do extensive planning along the corridor in advance, can't they couldn't a private developer just build what they want without having that additional planning? And so I just would like for you to speak more on that. Um, and especially because right after the hearings, as I'm sure you know, the mayor announced five new community planning initiatives that are semi like small area plans for five different parts of the city. And so I'm kind of wondering how if areas are up plumbed, 
such as the New York Avenue corridor or any of these areas that already have heightened density, um, how are these planning mechanisms, in your opinion, going to even impact that if a private developer just goes and does what they want to do anyway? Well, my recollection, and correct me if I'm not remembering this, is uh, that um, what Trueblood, what Director Trueblood was saying was that um, the there would be built into these changes a requirement for small area planning before development could occur, and I, I, I we're going to need to look at that to see if that actually is the way it will work. Because if we simply increase the density on the map, and I'm trying very hard to avoid using the, pronouncing the acronym FLUM, um, if we just simply increase the density and then the developer can come in and get a change in the zoning, uh, we haven't gotten what we wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, so the back and forth from my notes um, was exactly that you had asked that question, but what True Blood said was it it's not a requirement. He just said that if it were to go to zoning, the Office of Planning wouldn't support it without having a plan put in place because it did contradict another section of the plan. But as we know, because of a lot of the different sections are being watered down or are not mandates within the plan itself, that isn't necessarily a requirement for them to do that planning in advance. It's just a suggestion. Um, and so, yes, like the Office of Planning holds great weight to the Zoning Commission, and so they would have to take that into consideration, but it's not necessarily a mandate for them. Yeah, and as you're characterizing it, that's concerning. Um, I, I, think, I think the best I can say at the moment is that uh, we will look at this. Um, I, uh, you know, in January, January is when, um, well, Julia Costa has been working on this considerably, as some or most of you know. In January, I turned my attention or my focus much more um, extensively, and I will be looking at, at issues like that. Um, I'm well aware of the fact that we can talk about what we want and create the incentive, uh, but, uh, but then not actually attach the requirement that we want in return. I mean, I've seen that over and over and over the years. And uh, I, I'm not interested in pretending that we're going to get more affordable housing and then get caught a couple of years from now where we don't. That's a long way of saying that um, um, I share the concern, not in the sense that I'm saying to you right now, oh gosh, this is badly worded, but I share the concern in that I want to make sure that we don't make that mistake. One of the questions that someone posed was about equity, and I want to ask this in kind of two ways. Um, the first is, and I've seen, I can sort of see the chat, so I will go to that for other people's questions and Parisa will get to that, um, but I can see some people asking about specific projects such as Ivy City, um, I know the Park Morton residents testified, Brooklyn Manor residents testified, people testified about developments in Ward 6. I don't know if someone specifically spoke on Greenleaf, but I know there were some Ward 6 representatives who included that in their testimony. And one of the things that I'm interested in is how do you, as a chairperson, see these different projects happening, hear this testimony from community members about the actual impacts of planning on their communities and how their communities have been affected and how do you incorporate that into your understanding of the comprehensive plan seeing that this is like a broader vision i know you said a lot of that goes down to the ward level member and deference is given to them but for you as someone who is an expert in this like you've been on the comp plan for many years how do you hear that new stuff coming up from particular community members and incorporate that into your analysis of what needs to happen for the amendments I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, I guess what I would say is that where, where there's controversy around a particular site, what the Office of Planning is proposing, or maybe they're not proposing anything, but there's controversy around it. When I see controversy, 
I mean by that really where somebody brings it to attention, not necessarily disagreement, two different sides on whether development projects should go forward, but just somebody, let's say, proposing a development. Um, then I will look at it more closely, but I will look at it, I guess the best I can say, and this is uh, my honest answer, is that I will look at it with trying to get a sense of whether I think that this is just about a developer trying to maximize profit and we're not really getting anything out of it. Or are we getting something out of it? Now, the way I just said that, I don't want to create the misimpression that I think that the city should extract a benefit out of every single project. That's the difference between matter of right and planned unit developments. Mm -hmm. So if we say that all the housing on this block can be three stories and everybody can build the three stories and we don't need to, we, we shouldn't, it's unfair to try to extract an additional benefit. If we say that the zoning right now allows three stories, but we'll let you go to five stories in return for uh, doubling the IZ requirement, I said doubling it, then we should get that. We shouldn't just say it and then not get it. Um, often it's more complicated than what I just described and it could be a redevelopment of a larger square or a project and what are we getting from that? So I, I'm rambling a little bit in my answer here, but you had mentioned Park Morton and Park Morton reminds me of the uh, concern about whether we are actually building one for one replacements and whether the people who are displaced have a meaningful right of return. And I bring that up not because I wanna talk about Park Morton, but because I think those are examples where the government in the past has said something, but didn't really follow through with the commitment. Mm -hmm. And promises like that are significant enough in my view that we should, the council should look for ways through the plan that we can um, make sure there aren't loopholes, that we, we get what we, what we want. Yeah. And when you say we, when you say we should get something out of this, who do you mean specifically? Well, that's a good question. I don't know who I mean by that. Um, the we could be the government or it could be the council or it could be the public interest, however you define that. Do you, in your analysis of this, is it ever the individuals that are directly impacted right on that site? Uh, they definitely have a role, but um, I can't say the way you phrased it, that every time that they would have the controlling role. Um, I mean, remember the way you phrased it was the individuals on that site. The people who live there. So for example, the Park Morton tenants or the Brooklyn Manor tenants or the Ivy City residents in that particular neighborhood, that situation is different than these two housing situations. But I mean, the people who are maybe the tenants who are there, maybe the neighbors that are right surrounding that property, people who would probably be considered to have standing in a case. Well, the people who have standing ought to be, for sure ought to be heard and ought to be considered. Uh, remember, or maybe you don't remember, but I started out my life uh, as a tenant in a housing complex that was very busy um, uh, opposing development projects. And of course, we thought we were right. Um, I think we've got to be listened to. That is, I'm saying we in the first person as if I was speaking back then. Um, but not, not to the point where one has a veto. Um, so you had mentioned um, Brooklyn Manor and you mentioned Park Morton. Brooklyn Manor, if I remember correctly, is privately owned. Mm -hmm. um, Park Morton is public housing. Mm -hmm. I would say, and this maybe isn't right, but my off the cuff is that the public housing tenants because it's public housing, it's government housing, have a little bit more, should get a little bit more deference than the 
tenants in the privately owned housing? And maybe I haven't thought that through. Uh, yeah, I, one caveat, and then I wanna to continue to hear what you have to say is because many of the residents in Brooklyn Manor receive public subsidies, they, it's an interesting dynamic because while the city doesn't own that property, the money that's being used by the tenants, the subsidy is public. So how do you, I, I understand the distinction you're making, but so can please continue and talk about that. But I just wanted to throw that out there as well. Yeah, and I don't know, I don't know if it's fruitful really to go down this path. Um, and I don't know how much of a difference it makes. I think that the residents who live uh, at or around a property ought to be heard and um, and um, and their views considered. They understand the neighborhood, they know the neighborhood. Um, one point about Park Morton is that um, they are public housing tenants. They're, they're tenants of the government and we promised them a, um, a build first and a uh, right of return. Um, we can't promise that of a private project, although we could require it of a private project, if the private project is going through a discretionary zoning approval process, which I think Brooklyn Manor did. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's a function of whether it's a condition of the uh, order. This conversation is about the comp plan. I don't know that we want to get to that level of specificity in the comprehensive plan. I do think it's important that the plan prescribes that where there are community benefits and a right of return would be a community benefit, that um, the community benefits have to be meaningful and that um, they have to be such that they can be um, whatever, enforced. Mm -hmm. So it drives me crazy when I see that a PUD, the, the community benefit or the amenity is they're going to plant trees. It's 10, 15 years from now are dead, and then what happens? Uh, to me, that's not a really meaningful community amenity. I'm not being absolute when I'm saying that, but uh, I think something like uh, providing um, affordable housing for the life of the project is a more meaningful benefit than um, providing landscaping. Mm -hmm. Not all the time, not being absolute, but generally speaking. Yeah. Uh, and when we have something like a community benefits agreement, which I think more often than not is not enforceable, that concerns me. Because then everybody's like, okay, we'll let you do this. Uh, we extracted nothing from you because we have this community benefits agreement that's not enforceable. I think I'm going beyond your questions, but I hope it's helpful. No, yeah, I think, I think this is important for people to hear and I appreciate you having this discussion with me because we, yes, the comp plan, maybe it doesn't necessarily get to the granular level of each individual detail of each individual project, but it lays the foundation for what can happen there. And so I think it's important to talk about it at this level because we can see how the comprehensive plan, how the decisions, the policies that are enacted actually play out. And I started this series of questioning with saying someone raised an issue on equity and then I jumped into these particular session or you know areas. And I think for me sometimes like equity in this current context also has to do with timing. And so that's why I was asking you like, who is the we because, and like, who do you include in that? Because if it's not the people who are getting directly displaced then, even if, if those, you know, if people are, have to move out so that a redevelopment can happen, but the redevelopment offers new affordable housing in that context, say, there's no guarantee necessarily that those folks are going to be moved back in there. And so I think that whole thing has to be included in the analysis to say, is this still equitable? Because oftentimes to your point about the trees, like there are some things that will take time and there are some things that will only, um, you know, they'll take time to, to play out as a benefit or they will be a temporary benefit, um, but they won't necessarily be impactful as a whole for that community long-term or they won't benefit the people who are there. And so then does that balance out? Like does that displacement then balance out? What actually is equity um, in the context of how this gets implemented? So the, the question on equity that um, someone else asked and I'll get back to this is talking about displacement too. 
Um, they said equity is rarely, if ever, mentioned in the amendments as a goal. It's mentioned as like a list of goals that are accompanied by measurable policies to implement, or that not, that are not accompanied, excuse me, by measurable policies to implement that equity. And there are no changes to existing policies to increase opportunities for home ownership and generational wealth building. Does this council intend to add or substitute policies to address the many failures or gaps in the amendments with respect to these issues? I'm really not sure how to answer that, maybe because it was a long question. Um, I think that... I can ask it shorter. How do you, how do you see equity play out in practice? I guess I would be curious to hear your answer. I think equity is, as a term is thrown out a lot and we can drop it in kind of like affordable. And we know affordable is defined specifically in the comp plan and in other places within our law. But how do you define equity? Like for you personally, how do you see that being implemented on the ground in practice? And you could even use the examples that we just gave. You don't have to get into specifics, but just so that people can you know, see it actually playing out um, for, for those neighborhoods. Well, you're right that equity is becoming an overused term. And I don't think it means the same to everyone. It has um, uh, people, people interpret it differently. If I look at the projects we were talking about, with regard to the tenants in a public housing project, if, I think the more I think about it, the longer list I'll come up with, but equity would include the fact that first of all, the, the tenants in a public housing project probably aren't as skilled as, let's say, tenants in an apartment building on Connecticut Avenue and advocating in their best interests. So what are we doing in the development process to ensure that their concerns are um, heard and understood? That's one piece of equity. Uh, a second is that um, I would say equity is for like the tenants at a public housing project is minimizing the burden of displacement. But if the project's being redeveloped, there's going to be displacement. Um, but minimizing that burden. And I think also that uh, equity is saying to these tenants, uh, part of the, the value you get from this inconvenience of displacement is that you're going to get a new unit better than what you have now that will be um, near or here or your choice. I think that would be equitable. Um, I, there probably, if I thought about it more, or if you um, came back with some ideas, I could think of other ways that equity could be put there. Yeah, I guess um, to your first point, bullet point about what equity would mean for Park Morton, for example, you said maybe the tenants there, the public housing tenants, wouldn't have as many skills as tenants that live in like a Connecticut Avenue apartment, for example. And if I'm per, um, incorrect on that, you can. That's what I said. Um, and so, and again, I, I'm only using Park Morton as an example. because. And, and when I said, so. let, me, let me be clear. When I said skill, I, I'm not sure I use skill, but um, the same ability. Uh, it could be um, an ability to get off of work or the fact that uh, they have so many jobs they just don't have any time or it's got to be a meeting in the evening or on the weekend or maybe some other way that they can have input or the fact that they don't have access to a lawyer uh, that they can't get some good advice on how to represent their um, their position, uh, even identify what their rights are. Right. I mean, so for if, skills, you uh, mean for like making their voices known to someone like you, like decision makers doing advocacy on behalf of themselves. Yeah. So to that point, and I think Park Morton is such a beautiful example of this because many communities um, have been surrounded by this kind of ecosystem of support um, because we're intimately aware of that fact. And 
for Park Morton, for example, they have their own Park Morton equity plan that they've put together with the assistance of ANCs. Um, I think some attorneys, I won't speak for them, I'm not sure, but definitely organizers, definitely people who have been in the game for a long time. And many of them have experienced this too, because as you know, like even to apply to get into housing units or even to apply for a voucher, even to get into public housing, it's a very bureaucratic process. And so people get skills by doing that. Um, I, I would argue, I mean, we work with clients who go through that every day. Um, so if that's true, if you have tenants who are in public housing, like the Park Morton tenants who have put together a fairly sophisticated plan or something that they think could work, do you think, I guess for me, because you were saying like, if I came to you with more stuff about what could be equitable, for me, like equity is actually paying attention to that plan, like taking that plan seriously. And so how do, how do I guess, what do you say about that? Like if, if a group does have those skills or they are surrounded with a support network, network and they do bring that to you or they do bring that to other council members, it's it, from what I have seen, it's not necessarily that it's not um, well thought out, not you know done well. It's more getting folks to actually hear them out and listen to them because there's all these other pressures, there's all these other people. Um, you know, you had like, I saw your back and forth with the Golson and Stores attorney, you know, who testified. Um, at the comprehensive plan hearing. So you do have all these other in entities. So how, how do you kind of reconcile that when they do have those skills, they do have the people supporting them? Well, let me be clear again, because I said this a minute ago and then I saw a chat pop up. When I said skill, I'm not sure I used the word skill, but even if I did, I didn't mean like they're not smart. I meant like the, the time, the mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you can't get off from work, you don't have the ability to come to a, a daytime meeting. That's that's what I meant. Yeah. It was just a whole range of of um, challenges that are more difficult for people of low income. I'm just saying, and I'm not, I don't know that I'm seeing that for your benefit, Caitlin, but I saw at least one chat that popped up. Um, I feel like I'm going to get dragged into a discussion or debate over Park Morton, and I don't know that I really want to go there. And I don't, I didn't, haven't refreshed uh, myself on uh, Park Morton. But just generally speaking, if tenants come forward with a uh, proposal, a counter proposal, if you will, it ought to be considered. Um, excuse me, if they come through with it kind of late, that makes it harder for it to be considered. And the fact, the fact is, is that the plan may have some good ideas in it, may have some bad ideas in it. And just the, because they came forward with the plan doesn't mean that it needs to be accepted. Um, in fact, just kind of thinking back on my tenant days, uh, there were an awful lot of negotiations over things that we were demanding. And um, uh, so it, it needs to be considered. And um, I, I don't know that I can go farther than that on a, on a general level. Okay, and I guess to bring this back around, um, and for those of you who are maybe wondering, how did you get to this very specific line of questioning in the midst of talking about a 1600 page document on the comp plan? Um, I raise this again because, you know, I think someone put this in the chat too, but going back to the question about the flums, like you said, like you were talking about CBAs and community benefits agreements and when development is allowed to happen that doesn't have those restrictions or doesn't have to go through a true community engagement process, even, even though as we've seen a lot of those community engagement processes for the reasons you said, like they're very time consuming. You have on one hand, professional people who get paid to do this negotiation work. They have legal training on one side, trying to push for development. And on the other side, you have just people living their lives, trying to survive, stay in their communities, and also having to go up against these people, which means you have to pay attention to the ANC meetings where these things are raised and et cetera, the whole process. Um, but with that, at least there is somewhat of an opportunity or potential to have an opportunity to say, raise their voice in an articulate process versus if something is up plumbed and the development can happen by right, there may not even be that check because you're not going through the PUD, the PUD process. And so um, do you, 
I guess, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? I know, again, this may, you may not be able to answer this completely broad, but that's what we, one of the concerns that we have had with just the general up plumbing is, you know, it's going to cut out community voice because those checks and balances at least give some foot in the door for folks to say something and they have to be listened to. Whereas in the other scenario, they don't. Well, like everything else, none of these uh, questions or answers or situations are simple. So um, I know that there is a lot of criticism of planned unit developments. And maybe to oversimplify it, planned unit developments are situations where developers see an opportunity to maximize their profit, um, to enhance their greed, if you will. And uh, so we don't like planned unit developments. On the other hand, planned unit developments are absolutely what, about what you just said, an opportunity for the community to come in and the developer doesn't have a sure right to what he or she or it wants. And they have to go through this approval process and a community that's demanding that as part of the PUD, as part of the community benefits, there have to be the following things that are offered or the following changes or the following compromises. So it works both ways that um, by having a more discretionary process, there is this ability of developers to take advantage of a community that is not well versed in land use. And on the other hand, the only way that the community can be assured that it has a role is if there is some discretion in the process, as opposed to being a, a matter of right. Um, I mean, it just all I can say is it works both ways. And I think I'm going to say a little bit more because there was a thought that went through my mind after I gave you the answer about equity. I remember a couple of years ago that um, it was probably more like a half dozen years ago that I got a call or my office got a call from tenants um, just off of uh, Alabama Avenue, I think at 13th by the um, Southeast, by the St. Elizabeth's uh, stop. It was an apartment building. The apartment building was owned by Sanford Capital. And I went out and I met with the tenants. And what I saw, and I don't, I don't want to say that this was all me. I mean, this was, I remember meeting with them and talking with them. So I'm going to say this was more of a good process. Um, they needed leverage to deal with Sanford. They also needed time. They needed time and leverage. And everything was working against them. I mean, these are folks that don't have the wherewithal to go and hire on K Street, although they did have an attorney from the uh, Washington, um, I want to From say, my office. Okay. We represent your, them. Yeah. Okay. The Congress Heights tenants. Yes. Um, but I remember what I said to them was the, the strongest thing you've got is that you're in your apartments. And it may be horrible living there, but the fact that you are in your apartments it gives you leverage that the, land, that the owner, Sanford's going to have to deal with. This wasn't about arguing before the zoning commission. It wasn't about figuring out land use. It was about thinking about what do you do to get the leverage that forces the landlord or the developer to have to bargain with you. Um, and in that case, all it was was, you know, I actually all it was like this was simple. The conditions were horrible, but all it was was just stay where you are because eventually um, this is going to be so horrible for the owner that they're going to have to deal with you. I think what ultimately happened was that um, the attorney general came in and um, sued Sanford. Um, but so I make that point. It doesn't directly apply to um, issue of equity, but it is that um, it's not all about the comp plan or how you represent yourself or are represented for the housing authority or the city council or the zoning commission. It can be other strategies that give the community or the tenants leverage. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I, I could have a lot to say about the Congress side situation, but I think one thing that comes to mind for me that I just want to say, say to you, and then I'm going to turn it over to Parisa because the chat's blowing up. I do appreciate everything everyone's saying. And again, I'm not ignoring that at all. Um, we will get to hopefully most of that. But I just, you know, even as you were saying that, like the different strategies and um, the resonance, if, if you can hold on to your space where you are, like that is part of your negotiating power. 100% agree with that. It also sucks. Like, like you said, like those 
those units were really bad. And like, these are like 12, 13 elderly people surviving in a poop hole. Like, I, I can't, I'm trying to talk without swearing because like, it was really bad. And, you know, we've seen this pattern play out and I'm, I'm sure you know this, like we've seen this pattern play out with public housing. We've seen this pattern play out in um, some of the shelters, the new, the shelters that are new are, are good, like from what we've heard from people, but in some of the shelters, developers, entities, landlords, whoever allow for people, these units to go into disrepair on purpose, because again, part of the leverage is by having no one there. And, and so for public housing residents that are being moved out right now, they're even being incentivized to move because they're, they're getting vouchers to move. And they wanna move a lot of them because their apartment's a piece of crap because the, the DCHA didn't keep it up. But, and like, that's not equity. <laughs> uh, that's not equity. Like, uh, you know, I, you shouldn't have to have senior citizens um, wait out their landlord to be able to live in a nice place to fight for affordable housing. I mean, that's why those tenants stayed because they wanted to fight for more affordable housing for their community. So yes, that is a tactic. That is something that people can use. But what I, I guess my gut reaction to that is it shouldn't have to be. Like that feels really ridiculous to make people do that. Um, well, this takes us down another path and I'm not sure we should go down it, but I mean, really what we're talking about is um, power and folks right. who are in a position of power and folks who don't. But there are ways that people who are not in power can find power. So yeah, it was horrible for those tenants, but they found power. Um, and I've seen that situation play out other ways. So what we've tried to do, and I'm getting way away from uh, land use, is find ways that we can try to help folks who, we call them vulnerable population, but I could say people without power. Um, the civil justice, civil access to justice, um, where folks who can't afford a lawyer actually can get a lawyer for civil proceedings or in landlord tenant court. Uh, how can we find ways to help those who don't have power to be able to um, exercise their rights or advantage their position? Um, and I think that's completely appropriate for government to do and government to continue to look for ways that we can do more of that. Yeah, and uh, Therese, I'm turning over to you. My last thing, just to wrap this up is, um, no, you're right. I mean, I appreciate the recognition of power and that's, that's you, <laughs> like you have power. You are the head of our legislative branch in DC. And it's, it's great that you know that, like you recognize that power is so important because like people need you to help them to get that leverage. Um, maybe they wouldn't have to stay in bad conditions if more people said what you just said and actually you know, stood by them in those situations and didn't have to have them live in that condition for five, six years in order to get just a good home. Um, but anyway, thank you for having this discussion um, and it's gonna continue, but I'm gonna turn it over to Parisa so we can get other people's um, input and questions answered as well. Thank you. Okay, so we have a few people lined up that I'm going to be calling on and unmuting um, just for those people to get ready for that. Uh, Reverend Wanda Thompson, Sabrina Rhodes, um, Chris Williams, and uh, Sharice Muhammad, and Ambrose Lane. And then we're going to, um, from there, we're going to try to get at some of the other questions in the chat. Uh, the chairman originally had agreed to be with us till three, so please keep your questions as brief as possible. Um, and before we start, uh, Reverend uh, Wanda, you'll, you'll be first, but um, just for clarity, Chairman, can you describe what your process will be um, as you move to the markup? Are you going to rewrite the bill sort of similar to how you did the framework and reintroduce your own version? Or are you, or how extensive are you expecting your, your changes to be? Can you, can you give us a little intel on that? Um, <clears throat> some of this may be a bit technical, but we have the ability to hold over the comprehensive plan. We're at the end of council period 23, all bills die, but we have the ability to hold it over. The way it gets held over is that I reintroduce it as it was submitted by the mayor. So the document that will be pending in January will be identical to what you all saw and testified on in November. 
Um, we will proceed to markup, which I said will occur before the budget. And uh, um, that markup, I expect that we will be, um, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitating how I want to say this, but um, all the changes that the Office of Planning proposed, accepting some, not accepting some, and it will be probably uh, as thorough as what we did with the framework, which as you recall was we didn't just change a word on page 13, but we actually changed quite a bit. Um, and we probably will as well will be looking at, not extensively, but looking at other language, whether we see some problems that the also planning didn't ad address or problems with which we disagree. And I'm not thinking of anything specifically, but I just want to make it clear that we won't limit ourselves only to what the Office of Planning proposed. And how will you engage with your colleagues on that? Are you soliciting changes from them? Are you asking them what, what do you want to see changed and then compiling it? Uh, I will. Um, I will. I, I have not yet. Um, I don't want to encourage them to propose their own 1,500 pages of rewrite. Uh, a couple of members have already reached out, and uh, so I, I will be working with them. How many days before the markup will you release uh, the draft? I haven't decided, um, but uh, I recognize it would be a mistake if I followed our usual process, which is that we release the document 24 hours before the markup. Um, so I don't want to commit to a week ahead of time, but um, my guess is it'll be something like that. And you can remind me that I said that. Remind me I didn't commit to it, but I did suggest it. All right, so I'm going to welcome Reverend Wanda Thompson from Fairview in Ward 8. Uh, fail on. I think you mean fail on. Um, afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson. Uh, my question is, I sat through uh, both days of the comp plan hearing and, and I know that you did too. I mean, certainly um, that was a very long uh, process. My question is, in watching it, I noticed that you were present the whole time, but many, many of your colleagues on the council were not. Um, and my question is, so how do we as a community know that they actually do read and digest our testimony. And um, when they have questions, how are those questions answered? And then, um, you know, we're not privy then to hear the questions that they're asking um, at, if they had been like we would have if they had been in the hearing. So what can be done and um, to let us know that they actually have heard the testimony, have taken it in and uh, and for us to be able to know what the answers were to any questions they might have. Thank you. Uh, the fact that uh, not every member was present, and I don't remember how many were, I, my guess is it was a minority, I think that's what you said. Uh, that's not unusual for our hearings, and there are a number of reasons why more members would not attend a hearing. Um, with regard to the part of your question, which is basically how do you know or how can you be assured that they actually have read the testimony or looked at the document? I can't, I can't assure you of that. Uh, I can't, I mean, it's, how can I can't, assure, how can I assure you whether council members read every bill that's before us when we're voting on legislation? But I can say that um, the, um, that, to the extent that there are concerns you have with regard to um, sites in your ward, talk to your ward member so that they have to hear what your concerns are about uh, those sites in your ward. And to the extent that you're concerned about more general policies, um, articulate them and keep, keep, um, keep sending them to the members. I mean, the Grassroots uh, Coalition has been doing that. Um, and uh, it's kind of hard to not hear when you um, make yourselves heard. But, and, and I know other people have questions, but just quickly, just to say, but this is the committee of the whole. It's not one of the other committees and it's, and it's a bill um, that has to do with how development and growth is gonna occur in the city. So it's extremely sure. important. And it just seems like 
more committee members would have been present over those two days. And as I say, I watched and I saw that several members didn't seem like, uh, you know, that, that it was just very, the attendance was scant and sometimes you were there by yourself. I understand. And as I said, that's not unusual. Um, you can ask a member why they weren't there. I guess it's not completely satisfactory, but I can't make members attend a hearing. And uh, oftentimes there are reasons why members don't attend a hearing. That doesn't mean that they're not paying attention. Um, and in the end, the relationship uh, is one between the council member and his or her voters, so. I think that's a good segue to Sabrina Rhodes in Ivy City. Go ahead, Sabrina. Unmute yourself, Sabrina. Can you hear me? There you go. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to um, just remind you a little bit that I did testify the first day of the hearing. And uh, I testified against the up Fleming for Cremel School and the two adjoining properties. That's a full block. And I just want to ask you a couple of questions, but all of it is, is within the same area. Uh, do you support Ivy City by opposing the flum changes? Also, um, we have an issue with our voices not being heard. We have an issue with our voices being ignored. We have a very, um, very strong community presence in a lot of the hearings. We have Empower DC, Friends of Cremel. So um, the seems like here in Ivy City, the business, the business owners have more say so than we do. Do you approve of that as well? Thank you. Oh, also we want a small area plan and what, what is required for Ivy City residents to have a small area plan. Um, let me see, there were several parts to that. Uh, the first concerning the uh, changes in the uh, land use map uh, I can't say whether I support or don't support them. Uh, key to my um, answer will be where the council member is on it. That doesn't mean I will absolutely do what he what he wants. Um, let me see. The last part of your question was about whether business owners should have a unequal advantage. Do I support that or approve of that? I don't know it's for me to approve or support. Um, I think that in our deliberations, we have to be mindful of those who own prop property, those who conduct business who could be affected by whatever the land use is, but as well um, by the residents, what the residents have to say. And it's a balance and so much of what we do is about balance and finding the right balance. I think there was another part to your question, which I uh, skipped. Can you tell me what it was? Uh, about the, the small area plan. Um, I don't know if this is required in what the mayor sent down, but uh, if you want a small area plan, I, I'm gonna say, I, I don't wanna, this is gonna sound the wrong way. If you want it, we can put it in the, in the uh, what we do. Uh, I'm not saying we will. Again, this is gets into the comp the complicated process of how we go through voting on this. But uh, if you want a small area plan and it's not in the mayor's proposal, I would suggest you go to the board member and you say you want this. I would also make sure that my office knows this in writing. I'm not taking notes right now. So follow up, uh, make sure we know in writing, and um, I'll discuss it with the board member. And, um, but whether we could do that, we could do that. We could say in the plan that there has to be a small area plan. Okay, so when can we say that? Because we have been asking for- Anytime you want to. Um, it's a question of being heard and maybe you have to repeat it a few times, but you- repeating it. 
<laughs> uh, Julia Koster is on this call. I think she is. I don't have the grid view right now. So she's probably made a note of this, but I uh, want you to follow up with something in writing. Um, if I don't know if you testified to it, you can't make these points often enough. Uh, on this document, which is 1,500 pages, uh, almost 200 witnesses signed up to testify. Um, we're getting lots of letters. You, you can't make the point. You can't repeat it too often, so keep repeating it. But also reach out to your council member. I sure will. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Up next is uh, Chris Williams from Southwest. Whoops. Hi, my name is Chris. Um, a Southwest group called Friends of Buzzard Point recently submitted testimony that the housing element rarely discusses racial disparities and does not list gentrification as a critical housing issue. Race and racism are being whitewashed in the housing element. What can you say specifically about the force of the framework to further racial justice? And also you put forth a challenge earlier to enable people who do not have power to find power. There are increasing calls that the district is violating the fair housing provisions under the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and that judicial intervention should be sought. In communities like Southwest, the district is the main driver of gentrification. There are fewer blacks in Southwest than 10 years ago and 2,500 more whites. Do you agree that there is a basis for a civil rights and fair housing discrimination claim against the district? There were a couple of parts to your question and now I've forgotten the first part, but with regard to the second, uh, I'm not in a position that I could agree with a, um, a legal argument. Uh, I would need to understand it better and hear what uh, the opposing views are, if there are any. So I, I, I can't answer that question, whether there's a violation of the Fair Housing Act. The oh. first part of the question was, what can you say specifically about the force of the framework to further racial justice? Well, um, I think that with the amendments we have before us, we have to look at the language and see whether, uh, whether in fact we need to strengthen the, the language. Um, I mean, this is an issue that's become much more top of mind for, for everybody. And uh, to what extent does the, does the um, comprehensive plan with the proposed changes by the mayor uh, adequately recognize and speak to this. That's one of the things that we will be working on as we go through the markup. I think there was a little bit more to that or did I answer your question? Yes, I believe you answered the question. I only uh, mentioned at the top of my remarks that the housing element rarely discusses racial disparities and does not list gentrification as a critical housing issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, it kind of reminds me of um, when we got the framework several years ago and it said almost nothing about affordable housing. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what this public process is about and the hearing that we had is to, um, to, to see where, where in fact the Office of Planning's thinking has not caught up to where we are today um, in these conversations. Caroline Petty from Brookline. Parisa, I can't hear you. You couldn't hear me? No. no. Oh, no. No, I can. <laughs> you can. Okay, good. So Caroline Petty is next. Yes. There we go. Hello, Chairman. How are you? Hello. I'm fine. How are you? Good. Um, well, I have been sitting here listening to this. Um, discussion, very interesting. Um, but I have to say that I am feeling pretty pessimistic about um, where this conversation or where this debate on the comp plan um, is headed. Um, and that's because I, I think that um, ordinary citizens are at a um, decided disadvantage um, in the process. Um, and I see it, I saw it in the context of the framework element and I see it 
potentially repeating itself as we go ahead. I, I feel as someone, I've been involved in, in neighborhood development debates. I live in, in Brookland in Ward 5 for over a decade. I've always tried to participate constructively in those debates. Um, and I fe I'm feeling that uh, the Office of Planning led by the mayor, frankly now, um, is, is <laughs> almost an all out war on, on neighborhoods across our city. It used to be that our neighborhoods were a source of pride for the city. Um, they used to say DC, a city of neighborhoods. And it was a source of pride that here we are, we live in the nation's capital, but we consist of this conglomeration of really interesting, unique neighborhoods with, with real people. And now I think that has almost done a 180. It's no longer a sense of pride. And in fact, it's even a sense of scorn. Um, and people who care about neighborhoods and uh, stand up for neighborhoods and character and historicity and, and all those things that used to uh, be celebrated in this city are now an object of scorn and people who defend them are, are literally vilified. And I'm sure you've heard some, some of it yourself. And what we're looking at now is a document, the comprehensive plan that's before us and before the council that consists of a wholesale rewrite where everything positive about neighborhoods, about communities, about neighborhood protection, conservation, controlling growth, everything positive is stripped out. And a lot of that came up at the, at the hearing a couple of weeks ago. So I, it, it, I think it, it's very dispiriting for those of us who, who've been involved. Um, the, uh, the, the process is incredibly tilted towards developers. Um, over the course of decades, two PUDs go down in the courts and all of a sudden it just sets off this scramble, this avalanche of uh, um, effort to remove anything that stands in the way of growth in the neighborhoods. And I think a lot of that came out during the framework element debate. And even with you, Chairman Mendelssohn, and I count myself as a strong supporter of yours, um, too often we were fighting with you over protections that existed in the plan, like the um, R1B zone. Why we had to skirmish over issues like that at the 11th hour when, when we we're looking at a much bigger picture, I, I don't know. And small area plans, uh, a, another area. So I think what's now before us, unfortunately, because of the some of the losses in the future land in the um, um, framework element debate, is we're now looking at a whole set of categories in the future land use map that are written in a very loosey goosey way that allow almost everything, everything to occur. That in combination with um, a proposed set of hundreds of flum changes across the city, site specific flum, flum changes, including over 75 acres worth in Brookland alone over 75 acres worth. Um, and then on top of that, the rest, the rest of the document, the comp plan document outside of the flum changes that edits out everything meaningful, all declarative sentences, all dispositive sentences. And that's what's before us. Um, and so, you know, where does that leave me in terms of a question? I'm not sure where, where it leaves me, but I, I guess I, I just hope that you understand the magnitude of, of what ordinary citizens are up against here. I, I think um, the, um, yeah, I, I would have liked to have heard more 
potential interest in, you know, we're looking at this COVID pandemic, the, the city is collapsing economically around us, and yet there's no possibility of maybe putting this plan on hold until we sort of get a better sense of, of where that's going to bring us, or at least putting the flum changes on hold. Um, I, I guess my question is, you know, can you react to what I've said and, and give us some sense that this debate is going in a positive direction as far as you're concerned? Uh, well, Caroline, um, I've known you for years. I think you're too, um, too cynical about uh, the situation. I'm not gonna say that what the mayor sent down was a wonderful document, but I'm also not responsible for what she sent down. And the reality is that she can send down whatever she wants to, horrible or wonderful or anywhere else. Um, what really matters and what I'm responsible for is what we mark up and report out. Uh, when you talked about how this document um, is, um, I, these were not your words, but insensitive to neighborhoods and um, insensitive to our communities. Um, I'm reminded, I don't know if this helps or not, that you know, in my early years when I was very much involved with on the community side fighting for a stronger comprehensive plan, that what we had to deal with was what we called the Matisse maps. The uh, future land use map was these pastel colored blobs. And uh, somehow we all survived. And in fact, when you say we used to appreciate our neighborhoods, those are neighborhoods back then that existed with those Matisse blobs. So I don't think that the land use map is the end of our neighborhood quality. But um, the, the, mayor, the mayor can send down what she wants to. It's on us what we approve. To the extent that there are 70, 80 acres in Brookland that are being changed, um, I need to I need to know what the concern is or opposition is with regard to those changes, and maybe that's already been sent to my office. And Julia will brief me uh, next month on that. Um, and I said before, you need to work with a board member who may or may not agree. Um, and if he doesn't agree, then that becomes a bit of a problem because then I have to decide whether I'm going to disagree with him. But um, to the extent that the community is upset, that will affect the, the politics of it. Um, this is my reaction to, to what you were saying. Um, I think the community process is important and I also get that it's hard on the community. Uh, folks, want to be able to just live their lives without having to worry about a 1500 page comprehensive plan. But on the other hand, I don't mean this seriously, we the government could say you don't have to worry about it, we'll just do it without a public input process. I don't, uh, that would be worse. So um, there has to be input before we do something. And for better or worse, the Home Rule Act requires that zoning shall not be inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. So there has to be a comprehensive plan. I actually think that can be a good thing because it actually requires some thinking about what we want our future to look like, primarily from a land use perspective, but more broadly as well. So I think that's a good thing, but, and I think that the public process is important, but I recognize it's a burden. Thank you. I'm gonna to have to move to the next um, question, but I uh, did wanna check with you, Chairman, can you stay another 15, 20 minutes? I shouldn't, but I will. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. Okay, so Sharice Mohammed from Ward 7 is going to join now. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. How are you? I'm fine. How are um, you? Fine, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, my question is relative to the housing piece, and I do echo much of what Caroline just expressed um, in terms of my last six years of having been. Uh, an ANC commissioner, a number of PUDs that had crossed our desk in Ward 7 that we have worked, uh, worked on 
um, fought very hard on behalf of the community. My question relatively rega is regarding COVID and the impacts of COVID and what we have learned, uh, I would say flaws with the direction that I think the council is taking and the mayor is taking with regards to the comprehensive plan. And I think we're not necessarily acknowledging COVID and what it's exposing and what it's revealing regarding um, thoughts and intentions with regards to how this comp plan is moving. Well, I should say the discussion of the comp plan and comments are moving. Now, uh, from another perspective, um, we've been sort of battling with DCPS and the mayor on the reopening of the schools. And much of that has been based on the very metrics, reopening metrics that Mayor Bowser put in place back in June. Now, as we continue and as we, as we progress, um, when we look at, right now I'm looking at the uh, data points relative to uh, the schools and how much of these outbreaks, the outbreak data, number one are the colleges and universities, number two are the schools, number three are restaurants. So when we get to where these outbreaks are happening, at the same time, we've looked at the, the slow out the gate uh, traction of the contract take tracing. And we've also been questioning Dr. Nesbitt on the cluster testing and cluster data. So a lot of the mechanisms that are in place to help us try to get ahead of this thing in DC, in the District of Columbia, we're not necessarily on top of it. So my question to you is what is the council, what are you in the, in the uh, committee of the whole, what are you as council members, what are your inquiries regarding this? And what can we expect as residents uh, working with, along with a number of the council members, what are we doing with regards to flattening this curve with the spread and also, again, the data? Now, I've had some back and forth with some of the council members relative to the reporting and the data and the, and the transparency of the data and the accountability of the data. But my question primarily is what is the council prepared to do or what inquiries are, is the council making so that um, we are adhering to our metrics and we're trying to really move things in a method to uh, redress what COVID is telling us, what COVID is, is, is telling us in terms of, you know, the, the 8.7 rental vacancy. We're looking at, you know, we're looking at a myriad of issues that COVID has impacted. So what is the council willing to do? What inquiries, what, what steps are the council considering? Uh, in light of COVID and what it's revealing? Well, first, your question reminds me that there was part of Caroline's, uh, Caroline Petty's question that I didn't uh, speak to, and that is why don't we put the plan off until after the um, pandemic? Um, the, um, the plan is a, um, is a comprehensive plan looking at a number of different policies, but also uh, making some changes to land use. I don't know that um, the pandemic, I don't think the pandemic is a reason to put it off. Uh, whether we have medium density or high density on, uh, I don't know, New York Avenue, I don't think it's dependent on the plan. Um, perhaps whether a developer will build, let's say more office if we see office shrinkage become of the, because of the pandemic, but that's not something to delay the plan about. Um, the, um, and in fact, where we are today in our thinking in land use in the city, which is primarily focused on housing and affordable housing is different than where we were in 2006 when the plan was written. So our goals are gonna change and our needs are gonna change over a period of a decade or longer. Actually, this plan will be revised, it's supposed to be revised in five years. So. I just don't see a reason to put it off because of the pandemic. I don't, I, I just don't see that. Now, with regard to what else we are doing, um, the, there is an unbelievable amount of statistics that are available on the district's website, coronavirus.dc.gov. 
the last time I looked at the metrics with regard to phase one, phase two, phase three, while the, the number of cases was going up, we it were- still is. <laughs> we were, yes. Well, the last time I looked at it was just a couple of days ago. Um, the, uh, we were still squarely in phase two, which is where we are. Uh, the city is keeping up with contact tracing, although it could do better. As I recall, the numbers, some of those numbers were green, which would be um, very good. And some of those numbers were yellow. None of them were red. And as I recall, the numbers weren't changing that much. So again, we were keeping up with contact tracing, but it could be better. Uh, the mayor has tightened restrictions. So we're back to, I think it's 25 people instead of 50 uh, to try to control the spread. Uh, people are not behaving well. Um, that sounds horrible because I really think, actually I think folks in Washington are doing remarkably well in terms of wearing masks. Could be better, but doing remarkably well. We're not behaving like the MAGA people and we're not behaving like the folks in other states. Um, but there was a lot of travel at Thanksgiving and uh, so we're gonna, and, and it's colder weather and people are indoors more. And so we're gonna see the numbers get worse. Um, I think, I don't think, it, I firmly believe that um, when you compare what we're doing in Washington DC, which is adhering to the recommendations of the Department of Health with what other states are doing that uh, we really are in, um, we're, we're doing quite well in that regard. And uh, in fact, while the numbers have gone off the charts in some states, you're not seeing that in, the wa in Washington DC or in the region. So um, it's not a good situation. The numbers are getting worse, but uh, I would say that while we can be doing better, the district is doing well. We're following the science. We're not having these stupid debates about whether people should wear masks or don't tell me what to do. And um, we're doing better than other jurisdictions, even while the numbers are getting worse. Sharice, did that give you an answer or did I leave something out? Somewhat, somewhat. And I, I would I would just say in response to that, and we only have a few more minutes and I don't want to curtail the time, but I, I do want to just state that um, LSAT, we are still moving along with the planning of each school. We're also as constituents working with our various organizations throughout the District of Columbia, civic associations, organizations such as this. And we hope and appeal to the council that we can't, I mean, I don't know how long we'll be able to say that we're doing better than maybe some of the other cities, but when our numbers are escalating to the degree and with the propensity that it is, I think we're gonna have to make some, some more stringent steps and work with others outside to, to help us curtail this because I, I, I'm, I'm just concerned that um, much of, the spread is what we knew in the beginning. And we're not trying to, you know, we're not trying to point fingers or, you know, that that's useless. We need solutions and we need, you know, uh, collaborative effort to bring this under control. So I, I would just say that, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Okay, well, but I'm gonna disagree with you a little in this way. Um, we have a somewhat controlled community spread, but this is a pandemic. It's not in control and it won't be in control until we have the vaccine widely available. It just won't be in control. And you look at places like Europe that were doing so much better than us in the spring and in the summer, and then they had their second wave this fall. Um, to some extent, we are, the district is handicapped by the his poor federal policies or federal um, handling of this. Um, but relative to the other states, we're doing well. Uh, the fact that we still have capacity in the hospitals without going to the surge capacity, 
is a good thing. And that's really what this is about, is that the public health system will collapse if we don't uh, control the virus and the public health system still has capacity. It's not even close to, um, it's not even close to at the limit. Interrupt just because we're winding down on time and I wanna make sure we get these last few questions in if that's okay. I know we yes. can talk to you all day. Um, okay, so Ambrose Lane, you're next. Uh, thank you, uh, Parisa, and good to see you again, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for coming out and, and being in front of us because you didn't have to, um, but you did come out and uh, that speaks well to you. I also wanted to thank Parisa uh, for just doing a great job, a yeoman's job in gathering us all together over the last two and a half years dealing with this issue. Um, and I also wanted to say to Caroline that I'm going to get a shirt for you, Caroline, for you and I saying that, you know, I'm cynical and I love it. And so, uh, it, you know, there's a whole bunch that are cynical on this call. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, real quickly, I, I'm just going to say that, um, in my view, uh, that the comprehensive plan is handed down to the council is more driven by greed and maximum profit than it is by providing affordable housing as a right to the people of Washington, D.C. Um, and I'll, I'll just cover three quick areas and ask you a quick question. Uh, number one, there needs to be a refining of the definition of affordable housing. Um, right now, it's at 80% or below. Uh, that, is, that causes confusion, and it really uh, allows developers to take a wide swath in terms of what it is that they're actually doing. We need to actually have some subgroups within that 80%. In other words, 0 to 40, 40 to 60, and then 60 to 80 as affordable. Because What's affordable to someone who, at 80% AMI or M, um, um, family median income is different than uh, the area median income of say, for example, or the family median income of Ward 7, which is roughly $40,000 a year. And so it, it, it becomes very relative. So you have to drill down a little bit more and that could help to develop and drive policy both at DEMPED and for the Housing Production Trust Fund. Number two, um, you have to begin, and the council can do this, you can limit the profit uh, by developers in building quote unquote affordable housing. And, and I say that because the district government as well as the federal government issues grants all the time in which they say that you can only have 8% or 10% or 12% administrative overhead. You cannot have more than that if you are to apply for any grant for the federal government and sometimes even the district government. And the council can actually do this. They can legislate uh, that there is say, for example, 8% profit or 10% profit. Um, I, I do think that there is a contradiction with regards to, and this is my personal opinion, a contradiction with regards to market rate developers that are also developing affordable housing. Their goal is maximum profit. Their goal is not to provide housing for people. Lastly, uh, there was some, some concern about uh, community benefits agreements. And that's also something that the council can compel. Um, in, in other words, you have developers that apply for PUDs and then switch through MAP amendments to matter of right. And that has happened more often over the past three, uh, two, about two, two and a half years. And it is almost, it is almost ridiculous. It's almost the best known secret amongst developers. Hey, let's apply for the PUD and then apply for um, 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 a MAP amendment. And so that having that MAP amendment takes them, it takes the element of the ANC away from using their great weight. It also doesn't, doesn't compel them to do a community benefits agreement. And the council can compel any developer that is developing affordable housing to a regardless of whether or not it's a PUD or a MAP amendment. And then lastly, um, uh, Caroline did talk about scheduling, and, and this is something that I think is within the council's control and in your control. I, I, I would actually suggest that you consider um, scheduling uh, uh, the, the, the discussion around the compound and the hearings around the compound around area element. In other words, you know, I live in the far north, northeast and southeast area element. If somebody else needs to just mute their phone. 
trying to do it and it's not happening. Okay. So, so, Mr. Chairman, if you schedule, say, a hearing, a, a, a first and final, um, first hearing and a, and a final hearing around, say, each element, so you have one for the far northeast and southeast area element, then the communities in that specific area can then organize themselves to work with the council member or council members if there's crossover in terms of wards, and, and then that group of communities can then come into the council and provide their testimony. And if you did that with each particular area element, you would have more input from the community as opposed to having one big meeting where we talk about all these things where 300 people signed up and you're going until three o'clock in the morning. As, as chair, that is something that is within your power to schedule in terms of, and, and it allows for more community input, residential input, not only on specific projects, but on the overall um, uh, framework of the area element itself. So I would just hope that you would consider those things as you move forward. Okay. Um, I'm. I don't think I'm going to, I would mislead you if I said that uh, I'm going to think about and maybe we will have more hearings. I, I think we're past the hearing stage. Um, your suggestion that we have a hearing around each area plan, I don't think that came up at the November 12th hearing. Um, but people are able to comment now if they have specific comments with regard to area plans. So the, I don't know, the record may be closed in terms of what we have to file with the council but uh, we're still receiving lots of input and uh, we, we will look at all of that. Okay, I'm gonna be, we're at 319. So I'm gonna have to um, start closing. We had two more people who were gonna ask questions. I'm gonna go ahead and read their questions for them. Um, one question that uh, was asked by Maurice and echoed by many people is, uh, Chairman, can you identify any part of the city where increased density has actually led to increased affordability. I'm not sure there's an easy way to answer that. What's going through my mind is that there have been some projects that have come through the council, primarily because they involve dispositions where uh, the projects were uh, 80 or 100% affordable housing, and that was affordable at different levels. Um, St. Elizabeth's is one example. Um, the part of St. Elizabeth's, the East Campus, that's uh, closest to the intersections of MLK in Alabama. Um, I mean, I believe there are going to be hundreds of units there that are affordable. Um, I, I don't know how else to answer that. Would I look at the... Uh, um, can I ask you this? Have you have you also um, noticed that in many parts of town, increased density has actually done the opposite? It has led to much higher um, housing prices and eliminated affordability. Well, I think what we're seeing is that um, th through a combination of tools, we are either um, we are either subsidizing the development of affordable housing or requiring that affordable housing be a component of a private sector development. And that we're doing that throughout the city, although there's some areas where little of that is happening, such as west of the park. But that's being done across the city. Uh, maybe part of the reason why I'm struggling with this is because the way the question is framed Actually, the answer would be, are we concentrating affordable housing in a particular neighborhood? No, we're not doing that. Okay, let me ask you, this This question came from Meg McGuire. Is, uh, she asked, the ground is laid in the plan to get rid of single family zoning, clearly aimed at Ward 3, but the real damage will be done in places like Penn Branch, Deanwood, and Shepherd Park, where Black homeowners are building equity and generational wealth. How do you feel about the proposal to uh, get rid of single family zoning? Uh, I'm not supportive of getting rid of single family zoning. Um, that's, you know, I'm, I continue to look at the issue and to uh, consider the arguments that are being made. 
The primary argument around single families against single family zoning is that it is discriminatory. Uh, and what I mean by that, well, that it's currently discriminatory, which I don't really see. Yes, there's a lot of single family zoning in Ward 3, but there's also single family zoning in Brookland and in Penn Branch, um, in Michigan Park. Um, there's an argument that single family zoning is rooted in racism. To be sure, there has been a lot in land use that has been racist, like redlining and covenants, but those were not zoning. Uh, for instance, covenants in Chevy Chase, uh, they didn't come with the, the zone category, they came with the, with the development or with the neighborhood. And to be sure, we have to overcome that. We have to understand it and overcome that legacy. Um, there is an argument to be made that density can obtain more affordable housing, but it, it's not that simple. And I've heard that argument. And I think the sim simple, accurate, but simplistic response is, well, look at Manhattan, where you have the ultimate in density, and that's not affordable. So there's more to it than just simply looking at density and saying that's the answer to affordability. There's more to it. I have to emphasize that. There also has been a comparison to other cities where single family zoning is perceived as being against affordability. But you have to look at those other cities and see where housing is permitted and what the zoning is like. So for example, Minneapolis has taken steps to get rid of single family zoning. But Minneapolis, if I remember correctly, is something like 70 or 80% zoned single family. We're half of that. We allow housing in every zoning category except for industrial. Uh, so in a place like Minneapolis, single family zoning was very exclusive, exclusive in the sense that it's what, three fourths of the city. Um, and here, as I said, it's half that and we allow housing in every zone category. So um, I think single family zoning is not the enemy of affordability. We need to look though at whether uh, there are some ways that we can whether we can or we should tweak the um, land use maps so that um, we get more affordability. And having just said that, I'll repeat what I said before. Density by itself does not mean that there will be affordability. That was a long answer, but I hope that was helpful because I think this, this the issue around single family has been reduced to very simplistic and inaccurate um, interpretations. Hmm. I know you have to go. I just want to ask you a couple quick things on your way out the door. One is when will the markup be? Will it be in January or February or, or March? I doubt it will be in January. I have said before the budget, get the budget in uh, March, um, probably in February. Would you, uh, what's your reaction to the comp plan going through the, the new racial equity impact assessment process of the REACH Act? Uh, I'm gonna have to discuss that with our new racial equity officer. We have a, a racial equity office at the council. Um, uh, let me say, and this is not gonna be a, a short answer that the racial equity analysis is not going to be a simple thing and racial equity analyses are rarely going to be um, very simple, um, bright line analysis. Um, these issues can be very complicated and really what the benefit of the analysis will be is understanding how policies will promote or be adverse to equity racial equity, uh, but 
there, there won't be bright line answers to that. I, I give the example, and this was in the committee report, of um, increasing the tax, sales tax on cigarettes. We know that cigarette smoking is harmful to health. We know that health disparities are particularly bad in minority communities. We also know there's a lot of smoking in minority communities. So if we increase the tax, we decrease sales and smoking. We know that as a fact, and therefore we benefit minority neighborhoods. On the other hand, we know that nicotine is addictive and uh, we also know that uh, sales tax is regressive. So we take a mechanism to reduce smoking and we increase the financial burden on low income communities uh, with a regressive tax. What's the equity answer? Okay, so I've, I've heard you use that example before, but the question is just, you know, what do you think about the racial equity impact assessment being used on the comp plan? I know it might be complicated. It might not be, you know, totally, it's, it's maybe difficult, but what's your, because it's a new law. The comp plan is a very important piece of legislation. Um, it seems as though this is the type of thing we would want reviewed for racial equity impact. What's I'm your gonna have to, I'm gonna have to discuss it with our racial equity officer. Okay, okay, and my last question is, uh, one of the challenges that we have is is oversight, right? The, one of the primary jobs of the city council is oversight. Uh, and, um, you know, of course, oversight relates to enforcement and accountability. You're doing committee assignments at the beginning of the year. It's a new council period. You'll determine, you know, who will be the chair of which committee. You'll, you'll reorganize committees. Are you going to stick to your pattern of not allowing new council members to chair a committee? And how can the public weigh in on our views of you know, how committees should be reorganized or assigned. I will just put it on the record here that we're, I'm very concerned, I know many others are, about the lack of strong leadership on the housing committee. You know, the housing is, housing is of course one of our top issues. And I know you have just a small universe of people to choose from, but I really urge you to consider replacing the chair of the housing committee. We have gotten nowhere <laughs> on the housing crisis in the last eight years. I believe it's been, uh, or has it been eight, two, uh, four, at least four years that she's been chair in need of on. So what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Um, well, I am following the same process that I have in previous years uh, where I talk to members to get a sense of where there is agreement or the greatest agreement. Uh, I also look at um, whether changes can be made uh, and also what the collateral consequence of that is. So if I replace a committee chair, um, let's say education with uh, another member, and if I follow the practice, what some members have called the rule that new members don't chair committees, then I have to look at the current chair. And so if that chair becomes the chair of education, then who replaces that other committee? And um, I will say with regard to freshmen that in my experience, uh, the work of the council and the responsibility of a chair is such that it's better that a member have a couple years of experience with the variety of issues um, because it's really hard to take over a committee. And um, so I'm thinking about all these things. Now I do consider this to be very much an internal decision by the council. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not getting hearing suggestions from members of the public, uh, but ultimately the council will decide what its organization is. So I have to work with my colleagues to see where the consensus is. And that's the best answer you're gonna to get today. Okay. Well, again, Chairman, I wanna thank you so much for taking time to be with us. We will be sending you our suggested amendments um, by mid-January and hopefully working with you to incorporate many of those into the final draft. Okay, I yeah. want to thank everybody for the time they took on a Saturday afternoon to be part of this. Thank you so much, Chair. Mm -hmm. For those of you who are able to stay for a few more minutes, we're just going to talk a little bit about that process of, of doing our amendments. Um, I'm going to remove the spotlight. I don't know if the chairman is going to stick around or not. I probably um, will disappear, but I want to thank you. Thank you again, we appreciate it. 
Uh, okay. So um, for those who can stay just for a couple minutes, I want to just mention that we are uh, hoping to, you know, really offer amendments. Um, we want to offer, you know, things, language, actual red line language that matches the priorities um, that we've outlined. And, and is, um, did the chairman leave us? I just want to check before I, uh, I just want to thank everybody again and, you know, take a deep breath, give yourself a round of applause. I think you, you know, represented the issues really well. And um, I am going to pull up a couple slides just to talk about amendments. But if anybody wants to share any reflection on that, we can stay for another maybe um, to like 10, 15 minutes. Anybody want to debrief any? I, I, I do want to open the floor for a minute if anybody wanted to do that, because I know that was a lot, right? <laughs> um, so here's here's where we are. I keep having a problem with my sharing the screen. Um, basically, okay. So uh, by the next meeting that we have, which will be um, January sixteenth, will be our January meeting, and by January sixteenth, we want to finalize the amendments that we will be um, proposing, sharing with the chairman, and of course, advocating for. Um, we are going to have a shared Google Doc that we will, for those of you who are interested, we will invite you to literally make your track changes in the document. And um, I'm trying to pull up my slide, but I'm having a hard time there. Okay. Um, All right, so we know that the, the plan is very large and difficult. So here's where we suggest to start. You know, you can go to plandc.dc.gov. You can look at each chapter of the plan. Um, we would definitely encourage people to look at your area element and look at what it says for your neighborhood. Um, it may not say anything at all and you wanna add something. Um, things like the small area plan for Ivy City, you know, things that are very specific to specific pieces of land. We definitely want to um, support neighborhood based, um, uh, you know, thoughts on what the priorities are there. So please look at that. Also, you may have an area of interest or an area of expertise um, that you want to search the document and look for, you know, what does it say about land trust? What does it say about whatever section eight or whatever it is? Um, and then keyword searches. So this is what we do. Like you download the chapter from plandc.dc.gov and then you search for these words, right? Because you're not going to be able to read a thousand plus pages. Don't even try. You know, search for the words that are meaningful to you. What does it say about equity? What does it say about public housing, et cetera? And then these, this is part of the way that we can um, start to put together um, our thoughts on what needs to change. We will have a shared Google Doc um, we, you can either contribute your changes to that document or you can go ahead and take the document offline um, and turn it into a Word document. Let me know if you have any problems with this and I can help you and do track changes and then just submit it to us. But again, if your community group is working on amendments, your organization is working on amendments, we want to try to compile that. Like we're not trying to all repeat, you know, duplicate effort, right? We're trying to support each other. So to the extent that you can send that to us, then we can compile it all together and make it part of a, a submission that we, um, that we work on as a whole. Uh, we want to have those from, by, from you by January 11th so that at our January 16th um, meeting, we can um, you know, share what we've compiled, affirm what we've compiled, and then the, the next step from there will be um, we'll be asking for meetings with the different council offices, sharing that package with them and trying to get, of course, buy-in and support to the extent that we don't get um, support from the chairman to include our issues, we'll be looking for a leader who would be willing to um, su support them as an amendment. And then of course, and I'm gonna call on you here, Sharice, and then of course we, um, want to then uh, participate in the market process as much as possible, right? So as soon as we know it's out, we want to be looking at it. As soon as, um, you know, we want to be sending out an action alert as soon as we know what's in it so that we can ask the public. Again, we sent out an action alert on the last day of 
um, the the record being open uh, for testimony um, on the, the hearings and we're able to generate over 100 letters in in one day um, supporting our priorities you know to get in the record so that's the kind of stuff that we want to be able to do um, as we get through the markup and then you know uh, it doesn't end until final until the second vote right they're going to vote on it twice before it's final so we we work on that uh, up until the end and he's saying before it will be completed before they get the mayor's budget, which is usually in early March. Sharice, you wanted to say something? Yes, thank you. I want to just, just say thank you, Caitlin, Parisa, you guys are phenomenal. Um, I had to go off camera for a minute uh, on some of that, and I was literally just kind of releasing and decompressing. But I wanted to thank you both for the, for the compilation for this meeting, and then also too, Caitlin, how you handled Chairman Mendelson. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the other part, the, the second thing I wanted to ask was relative to what was discussed today. I think for me, I heard a little more from Chairman Mendelson today. So I don't know if there's gonna be like a, a strategy group, a working group as we, as we continue on. And um, I, I'd like to compare notes. With, a, with people from the group. I don't know who's already assembled to do that. Maybe that's something that we can do today, uh, figure out who would like to be on that group or how can we compare notes. There's a certain things that Chairman Mendelson said today, I think we can use and um, from the strategic standpoint and then moving forward as of course, um, everybody, you know, January 2nd or whenever, when they swear everyone in for the council, A and C commissioners, so I think much of what we've gained out of the hearings, what we heard from Chairman Mendelson today, I'm just in question as to, are we gonna strategize and kind of compare notes of what we learned today? Is that something that's on everybody's docket or is it maybe a few of us? It doesn't have to be everybody. I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you for that. Yeah, as you, as you know, we do have a steering committee um, that, that has been the body. And then sometimes we invite more people to have you know a debrief or to have a strategic conversation so please just let me know or let caitlin know you can email me uh, parisa at empowerdc.org or whatever reach out to one of us to, to let us know that you want to be part of um, strategy and follow up from here we are open to of course recruiting new people for the steering committee that's the group that um, make sure that these meetings happen and does, you know, the strategic work in between meetings. But right now, of course, our sights are set on getting through the end of the comp plan. And then you guys heard, like, there's so many issues related to the comp plan that then we want to take on. Is it, you know, additional legislation? The chairman mentioned the lack of enforceability around CBAs, community benefit agreements. That could be an issue that we take on. Mm -hmm. The uh, independent planning commission that's been um, mentioned several times, that the need for independence of the planning agency that could be an issue so the things that are related and of course continuing to build the capacity of grassroots residents across the city to engage in all the processes where development decisions are being made like at the zoning commission and the anc uh did i see somebody else who was trying to make a suggestion no but parisa i, I do think that the this the council schedule does become very important um, whether or not, it, obviously he's not going to delay anything during COVID, but just as the council voted separately on the framework element, what I was suggesting is that he's, that, he, that they vote separately on each area element. And I don't think that he understood what it was that I was saying. Um, and I don't know whether or not that's something that the group would want to push because then that would allow for more communities to have more say and more involvement in that process, even, even as the council would vote on each particular area element, not only would the, the councilman that, that has a jurisdiction over the area element, sometimes it's gonna be two council members, but if it's, if it's the council of the whole that is gonna be voting on it, then it, it not only does it allow for more organization, it allows for more interaction between those council members. And so that, that's, what, that's the point that I was trying to make. Yeah. Yeah, as you know, we called for that. I mean, we called for that from the beginning, actually. We asked the chairman to hold multiple hearings on each you know, important chapter, each important section, and he, he wasn't supportive of that idea. We tried to get the, uh, the round tables in the wards and got the three um, you know, sort of open house meetings that Caitlin mentioned. Um, Julia Coster, who's uh, Phil Mendelson's staff on this, is still on with us. So she, I'm sure she'll take back 
these suggestions to him and we can continue to advocate for that. Um, but at this point, Phil has been pretty clear that he does not plan any additional hearing. So I think it's like, do we want to hold something and invite him or invite the planning office or do we want to keep pushing for the other wards to do it? Another big win actually was, was another piece that I mentioned and that is that the council can compel community benefits agreements. They can compel it. It's not that they can't, they have the power to compel community benefits agreements, period. And, and, and even over uh, the ANC or, or at least compel that whatever development is gonna happen that that developer enter, in, enter into a community benefits agreement. It, it, it's something that the council has the power to do. But well, that's good to know. And again, something that maybe can be reinforced in the comp plan through an amendment or that we can follow up with a additional, you know, uh, legislation. People in the chat were talking about how ANCs can't sue and so they can't uh, enforce them themselves. So there may be some additional measures that this group can take on once we get through the comp plan. Any, I do want to open it up for just a couple minutes. Any other questions or suggestions or feedback on what we heard today? And you can unmute yourself because I cannot see everybody at the same time, so. Risa, this is Meg McGuire. Um, the Committee of 100 submitted uh, almost 70 pages of uh, amendments to the plan. Uh, Nancy McWood did a yeoman's job of analyzing uh, all the policies and elements, I mean, policies and actions and made suggestions about how they should be changed. Uh, we're working on a public version of that now that uh, helps to summarize the really fundamental problems in this plan. And we should have that ready within a week. And I, I would like to ask you if you could distribute that to this group. Yeah, we'd love to do that. Thank you. And, and, and again, in addition to if there are other groups on here or not on here that have been working on amendments that align with our values and our principles, we want to support them. So maybe your neighborhood association has come up with something or, or whatever. Uh, did I see somebody else was? Yeah. Caroline, Caroline, go ahead. Caroline, thanks. Um, just one thing to possibly consider. The, the chairman was very um, negative about the idea of um, holding or deferring uh, action on the plan until we get a better sense of this pandemic situation. Um, I still don't quite understand that, but um, it seems to me that short of something like that, um, one thing that he may be willing to consider um, is tying the effective date or the effectiveness of certain aspects of the plan. And I'm thinking like the, the flum changer changes, um, the map changes, tying the effectiveness of those changes to certain actions taking place. Um, and, what I, and what I'm talking about is, um, in particular, he's, he, he himself seems to recognize that with all this, the flum changes and, and the move to map amendments and away from PUDs, the city and residents are going to lose important opportunities, whether it's for affordable housing or parks or, you know, input or other, other community benefits. Um, and maybe there's a way we could think about, you know, getting into the comp plan legislation, um, a linkage between the effectiveness of the flum changes or the map changes and something else happening. Uh, I, and I don't have a well-developed idea, but, um, Something like that seems, you know, it stops short of holding or deferring action on the plan, but kind of conditions at least some action on something else happening that benefits. I see you, Eleanor. I'm going to call you next. Yeah, I agree with that idea and, and some, yeah, some kind of trigger, including, and that may also be things like the vacancy rates you know, have to reach a certain level before that they would, you know, do certain things or, um, you know, something to that effect. In other words, do we even need, all the, he, his argument has been, well, the private market's not going to build if there's not a demand, but 
to William Jordan's point, who teaches us regularly about this, the city is subsidizing the development. So yes, they're going to keep developing. They're still, you know, and there's other ways that they're making money and investors and foreign investors and all this stuff. They don't always even care. The big developers don't always even care if they have vacancies. It doesn't hurt them that much right. financially. So, so yeah, we can't just rely on, well, they're not going to build if there's no people, you know, that they, 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 they're still making money right now. Uh, Eleanor. I, th I think, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a limit to what we can do with the comp plan. I think we're going to need legislation. Uh, I think the perfect thing was the community benefits. So I would like to suggest that there be a, a, a another effort to join the comp plan amendment effort, uh, in addition to the comp plan amendment effort, to work on legislation. I totally agree. And I think, again, that's where we're, our sights are set once we get through the comp plan, because, you know, I, I know we won't have um, the ability to do both at the same time. And thank you, Patrice. I saw your um, your message about helping with that. We and, and also the council won't be ready to take up anything else. And, and right after they go through the comp plan, they're going to go through the budget. But if we can get ourselves prepared so that after the budget, we have legislative initiatives that we're pushing, that would be the ideal position, right? Uh, anybody else? I'm going to, you can unmute yourself. If I see a hand raised, I will respond to that. Uh, Jean. Yeah, I was just going <clears> to <throat> typing this into the chat, um, but I bothered by the fact that Phil keeps talking about housing shortage and believing that there are still hordes of especially young people, you know, that <clears throat> are going to keep pouring into the city. And um, I don't know how that comports with what we seem to have even before the pandemic of an ongoing fairly substantial vacancy rate. And I would like to have some way of being able to tap into real-time data on vacancy rates and projected near-term um, growth or not in city population. Um, we not only have the pandemic, but I think even before that with uh, uh, things becoming more and more unaffordable that some of the young people who flocked here are flocking out again because they can't afford to live here or they want to start families. But anyway, I, I don't know how we could do that, get that kind of information, but I would really like to have the Mendelssohn and other council members become aware of the fact that, that it's not a given that the city's going to keep expanding like crazy. Yes, agreed. And, and again, many of us brought that up in our testimony because even the CFO has reported, the chief financial officer has reported, right, that the growth rate is negligible now. I think they were saying only a few hundred uh, net gain of residents last year. That's and right. that's before COVID, right? And then we saw what, uh, we lost at least 15,000 residents just in the first couple months of the pandemic. So it, it certainly, I think going back to Caroline's idea is something that could be set up in some type of trigger that these are the types of things that have to be evaluated before the council would, you know, up flum or certainly subsidize development, that type of thing. And, and uh, three, Ambrose, uh, uh -huh. yes, um, uh, I, I'm going to go back to the idea of limiting the profit of the developers. Um, it, it, it's not as if there is no precedent for that. Like I just said, you can't apply to a for a federal grant and not have a limit on the, the amount of, of administrative overhead that's built into the grant. So if the developer is using city money, um, the, the city can use the same sets of standards that you can only that you're you're limited in the profit that you can make from building affordable housing. The issue, as I said earlier, is greed. It's not so much profit; it's greed. And so, if you have a developer that is developing market rate housing that's also developing affordable housing, their pro th th their goal again is is to milk as much money to get maximum profit, even out of their building of affordable housing. And if you take that out of the of the of the equation then, or you could say, okay, anyone who applies for money for the Housing Production Trust Fund, um, no commercial or market rate developer can apply for that. Only affordable housing developers can apply for that money. 
So there, there's a number of other things that we can do both on the policy side and on the legislative side. Thank you, and, and Reggie has his hand up. I'm gonna call on him next. I think Ambrose, uh, we've raised that issue before. There's no transparency around how much the developers are profiting. Exactly. We, we never see exactly. the other end. We're always told, well, we can't do this project unless we have this money from the That's city. That's right. From oh, the city. And, we're and never one last thing before Reggie, one last thing before Reggie. There's something else that we're not getting to the bottom of, and that is uh, there are uh, affordable housing uh, builders across this country that are using different materials than what traditional developers use. Um, you have container housing that is built all across this country. You have uh, what's now uh, coming up in Europe, which is 3D concrete housing that is also, uh, these, these, these are sturdy 40 year um, built to code types of housing that are built at a fraction of the cost. Uh, in South Africa, there was a dorm of a hundred kids that was built from old grain silo, eight stories high at a fraction of the cost of doing the development if they use the traditional materials. So that's something else that we really need to start looking into. Okay, Reggie and then Chris Williams. Go ahead, Reggie, you can unmute. Okay. Yes, I just, I just want to second uh, what Ambrose is saying there. And what we need to take a look at, a buddy of ours um, shared this with us that there's certain legislation that exists in DC that says, uh, uh, entity that is in, you know, investing in within the district uh, for like housing or whatever, they get a 12% uh, REO or, or ROI or return on investment. So if we want to take a look at trying to take that incentive out for people, we need to find that in the DC code and put forth maybe, you know, a voter led type of thing where that comes out, because that could be something budget neutral that could go on referendum. Thank you, Reggie, appreciate that. Chris, we're gonna try to start we're wrapping up so we close by four. Go ahead, Chris. Um, what I would add is that we not only have the political channels available to us to get at many of these challenges, as we're doing now with the, mem the calls with the council members. But let's not forget, we also have uh, legal uh, avenues available to us. There are laws on the books about human rights, about fair housing, both at the federal and district level, and those, uh, um, in my opinion, should be vigorously pursued because at the end of the day, our democratic process is not working in DC. It is usurped by developer interests and we are constantly being undermined as the electorate. And I think that we have other branches of government through which we can channel our objections and i think that a judicial body would welcome these challenges and i th think we we should not take those off of the table we we agree with that and of course we've um got some attorneys with us caitlin's an attorney um i think it's both it's all strategies right we need to use all strategies including legal unfortunately the legal stuff does take years to play out <laughs> and i'll tell you like in the case of berry farm even though there was a win it, it was still a loss because people still were displaced so we you know we have to just be mindful about what can be um achieved but i sometimes they're good for other purposes even just for you know greater public awareness maybe in some cases building political will and show, showing that there's a, a force to be reckoned with. So I agree, uh, legal strategies are important. Okay, any final comments before we close out? Uh, we will send a follow-up email. Uh, we will be inviting people to participate in sharing amendments on the Google Docs. If you have something to share that you've already been working on, please email it to me and I will help compile it together. Um, if you want to be more involved, either joining the steering committee or in a group of, you know, for strategy uh, over these next couple months, please let us know. We welcome you. We thank you for your interest, your time. You've stayed on an extra half hour. This says a lot about you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Um, if, 
if there's nothing else that needs to be said, we'll close it out. Okay. Thanks just, again. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to make one announcement. This Reggie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, be on the be on the lookout for information for you know PFFC annual uh, homeless memorial and vigil. Um, we have a few live events which we'll have to you know adhere to the social distancing guidelines. But we are also have virtual offerings that will be going out on December twentieth and the twenty first. So please join us. Okay, we'll definitely support that annual homeless vigil. Memorial Vigil. Thank you, everybody. Have a good weekend. Take care. Mm -hmm.